Well, it is 4.01, uh, which is my indication that it is time to begin. So uh, before I welcome you all to this session, and we're so just so honored to have some of your time today, I want to let you know that at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat button. And when you click on that chat button, it'll open up a little window called Zoom Group Chat. And in there, you'll be able to communicate with me, communicate with Scott, and communicate with each other. And what will happen when this webinar starts is that we'll be muting all of your lines. So we don't want to mute your line. We don't want to stop you from being to contribute and certainly to ask questions. So let's make sure we have that chat bot open and you'll be able to um, ask all the questions that you want. Well, not all the questions that you want. All the questions we'll designate as being our favorites. So with that box open, and if you have any trouble, um, reach out, but we'll get started. I want to start by uh, welcoming you all. Um, we're certainly represented from across Canada and some folks in the United States, which is just a wonderful thing to see. Uh, my name is Jennifer Sanford, and I work for Ducks Unlimited Canada as your national content curator. If my voice sounds a little familiar, I am the host of the podcast, Ducks Unlimited's podcast in the reads, which I know you all listen to and all love and all share with your friends. Um, and if not, it's available on iTunes. Um, I am very pleased to be here to welcome Scott Stevens to our first uh, masterclass event. And he's uh, prepared a wonderful two-part presentation to talk about what's happening with ducks and then what's happening in our conservation world. But before I start, I, I kind of just want to give maybe a 40,000 foot overview from my point of view. Um, you, you folks as donors are a very important part of our conservation puzzle. I want to tell you that in, uh, long before I was the host of the podcast, I was a scrappy little farm kid from Teepee Creek, Alberta. And my dad was a banker. My dad was an ag banker, um, helping people in the ag sector to make sure that their family homesteads and businesses were passed on to generations to come. And he used to talk to me a lot about the value of stakeholders and how they have a genuine interest in what it looks like to have a return on investment. And I think that that ultimately shaped my engagement in the nonprofit sector and certainly my employment at Ducks Unlimited because donors such as yourselves are our stakeholders. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to make a buck. It's another thing to choose to give that buck to an organization that's going to do good work. And the vision of Ducks Unlimited has always been to take that buck and make sure that we can maximize the good work that it does. And part of this evening is really recognizing you as very important stakeholders in our business. Uh, our business would look very different without you. And I, I think you know that. And so please know this evening that while we're inside helping to share our conservation message, a good portion of our staff are outside doing the conservation work that you've committed to helping see through as one of our stakeholders. So please acknowledge you're a very important part of the puzzle. So this evening, we hope to entertain you. We hope to educate you, teach you something you didn't know. But most of all, we hope that you have a tremendous sense of our thanks and our gratitude and a real sense of pride at the return on investment we're providing to you as our stakeholder. So with that, I'll pass it over to Scott Stevens. And uh, for those of you that don't know Scott, Scott is our regional operations uh, person in the prairies and the boreal. And he's leading a team of about 180 people uh, who are working out in the field and in our offices to have a conservation impact in those areas. Uh, I hope you brought your dictionaries. This man is very smart. He has a bachelor's degree in, in sciences, uh, both a master's degree and a PhD, all focused in waterfowl ecology. Much like Carla and Jim and Dave, he has this strange affinity for these pintails, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about more today. Um, Scott was in our, on the American side in DU Inc. for 15 years before coming over to join our Ducks Unlimited Canada side for the last 10. One thing you do need to know about Scott is that he's handling the quarantine much better than I am. He's spending his time, and I'm going to read directly from the card here, uh, carving cork canvasback decoys, cork blue teal, blue winged teal tip, uh, feeding decoys and blue wing teal silhouette decoys. And I'm very upset at the person who thought I was going to be able to memorize that. So 
with that, I'll pass it over to Scott. He'll do the first part, and then we're going to pause for all your questions. Then we'll talk about the second part, and then you know the party's on. Todd, I hope you brought more wine because we're gonna we're gonna talk ducks uh, for the next hour. So with that, Scott, way. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, under more, under more normal circumstances, we'd probably be doing this kind of event in person with a group of folks like you who have provided support and that kind of thing. Um, under the current circumstances, we thought that this was the next best thing. Um, it is definitely uh, a really cool time of year if you're interested in birds and waterfowl in particular. Um, so we're right in the middle of, depending on what species we're talking about, we're still, could still be undergoing spring migration and coming back to breeding areas. Some species are undergoing pre-nesting and then a few species already have eggs on the ground and they're beginning the nesting period. So we're going to talk about some of that tonight. Um, as we think about looking all across Canada, uh, we have breeding areas spread all across um, this country. So if we start in the east, there are breeding areas, um, prairie pothole region, of course, one of the continent's most important breeding areas. We also have breeding ducks uh, along the west coast, and then of course the boreal forest in the north. So we're going to try and think about uh, different species of birds that use those different areas, and then we're going to zoom in a little bit um, to the prairies and talk about a, a project and, and how that fits in with the big picture. So we'll start with breeding areas in eastern Canada. So, you know, common species would be things like black ducks, ringneck ducks. Black ducks, I suspect, uh, have eggs in nests now and they're going about their business. Ringneck ducks are probably in that pre-nesting phase right now. So folks on the eastern part of the country are probably looking at lone male black ducks sitting around and still pairs of ringneck ducks. When we move to the prairie pothole region, um, we of course have common species like pintail and, and mallards that would definitely have nests on the ground. I know I was out uh, last weekend and saw lone drake mallards hanging around, so that means females are on nests. Um, so they're the whole suite of species that we have breeding in the prairies, and we'll zoom in and talk about a few more of those here in a minute. As we sort of move to the west coast, we have uh, some different species, species like Pharaoh's golden eye, um, in more intermountain areas, things like uh, uh, other species that nest in these riverine environments like harlequin ducks. So, you know, a diversity of species as we move across the country too. And then finally, as we make the jump to the boreal forest, even more unique species like several species of scoters, like black scoters that we show here. And then that's the core breeding range for lesser scop. So that's, that's kind of the rundown. Unique species in each of those breeding areas, some more widely distributed across more of them. But um, it's really a cool time of the year where all of this courtship and and display and that kind of things going on. I mean, ducks do neat things all throughout the year, but I have to say the springtime has got to be the best time because they're really on full display. So a bunch of that activity takes place in the air where they're flying around. Usually it's multiple males chasing after one female. Um, gadwall, many times you will see as they're in the air, the drakes will try and pull on tail feathers of the female. Um, and then mallards are chasing each other all around the landscape too. Um, so part of what's going on with all of this courtship display is the reality is females are trying to select a male and they're trying to assess the quality of that male by his ability to fly and follow her, the brightness of the colors on his feathers and all those things. So she's trying to end up with the best genetics that she can um, in her offspring, so she's looking for the highest quality male that she can find. Um, pintails do all kinds of cool things in the air too. Multiple males chasing around a female, and I would say that pintails are some of the most graceful birds on the wing, where you know they're all flying in synchrony and twisting and turning at the same time. Um, green wing teal, same same kind of thing. So lots of the activity happens in the air and on the wing but also there's plenty of it that happens on the water too, where there are elaborate displays for some species with head throws and, and raising their tail and turning at different angles, all to impress the female. 
Um, shovelers are a unique species. They're very territorial around the female. So once she is paired with a given male, you will see him really defend that female from other males and he'll be aggressively chasing them off so she can be undisturbed and spend her time feeding and get ready to nest. So lots of cool, unique things for each species and we could probably spend a half hour talking about each one, but we'll kind of give you a, a big picture overview tonight. And then one of my favorites um, as far as courtship displays, this is the ruddy duck. So they are probably just arriving on breeding areas in, in the prairies here. And they arrive unpaired actually. So many of the other species are already paired, already have a mate, ruddy ducks. That's not the case. So the males are setting up territories and do some of these elaborate displays. This is a bubbling display that this ruddy duck male is going through. So he sort of beats his chest and blows air out through his bill and creates these bubbles in front of him. Um, you also see his tail is sort of sticking straight up in the air. They're, they're in a category of ducks we call stiff tails. And some of the research suggests that the length of those tail feathers seems to uh, drive uh, female selection. So if you have longer tail feathers, you're more attractive to the females and more likely to get breeding opportunities. So once again, we think that's related to the male quality, um, but that's what the female is trying to select. I guess the other thing that I should mention is uh, these courtship displays are pretty elaborate. And the other thing that they do is they're designed to ensure that we don't have a lot of interbreeding between different species. So they're pretty unique to individual species. And if you know, another species showed up and tried to do the display to impress the wrong species of female, it wouldn't work most of the time. And if you're really interested in, in this sort of courtship thing, uh, just recently here uh, on Netflix, there is this cool documentary piece called Dancing with the Birds that deals with birds of paradise and a bunch of cool birds from the tropics that really have elaborate uh, displays. They build these tall structures out of sticks to attract females. And they also have really, uh, really long and, and elaborate feathers and specializations that they've developed. So if during the quarantine, you thought you found the end of Netflix and you haven't watched Dancing with Birds, you can put it on your list. Um, so that's sort of the intro. And I think the plan here was to take a little pause and actually try and take some questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and we'll see if we have any questions yet. So while we wait for questions to pop up in the chat, I, I have a couple. Um, we had uh, Dave Howarder, our chief conservation officer on the podcast. Not that I keep talking about the podcast or anything, you know, in the reads available on iTunes, but he talked about in some species that a mate is chosen much earlier than in, in other species. So at what point do what ducks choose a mate for themselves? Yeah, so, um, you know, like, like many of the answers that we give on these questions, the answer is it depends. Um, so it does vary among species. So some of the early nesting species like mallards and pintails are pairing in the fall, actually, like in November on breeding areas. Um, I mentioned ruddy ducks aren't pairing until they arrive back on breeding areas. And um, for most of the rest, it's kind of in between. On spring migration, they'll be pairing up. There are definitely advantages to the female of pairing earlier. She has that mate to kind of be alert and vigilant and watch for danger. Um, but some species have worked it out like ruddies where it's like, nope, we just show up on breeding areas and then we pair. So it, it does vary by species. So it would make sense that different species have different courtship behaviors. So it's easy to distinguish themselves from another, from another, uh, breed of ducks, but we do know that every now and again, we can uh, encounter some inter interbreeding there. We have a, a conservation, we have a communications person in our Vancouver office who supports our, our BC conservation work. And he's just an outstanding wildlife photographer. And he took this gorgeous photo. And when we sent it to try to figure out what type of duck it was, there was no consensus until the eventual consensus that it was an, it was a duck that had interbred. So what, what, what happens when the, that interbreeding does occur? Like what, what's the long-term impact of that? Yeah, so, so it does happen occasionally. I would say most of the time there's a mallard involved and probably a mallard drake and a female from another species. So they're pretty aggressive. So 
that's likely how it happens. Um, but typically the, the hybrids or the offspring are infertile. So that's part of the reason why the courtship displays are set up the way they are, because you know, if you're gonna invest the time and energy in breeding, you want that to result in offspring that then transmit your genes in the future generations. And if you've chosen you know, from another species, the hybrid is typically infertile. So that's the challenge. Is there a, a, a connection between the importance of having a lot of open habitat and the ability to give these different species an opportunity to spread out? Like it would just seem to me that if there were very few pairing ponds in one particular area, you increase the probability of this inter, interbreeding. Yeah, well, the habitat base is definitely critical because, because of the territorial behavior that they have this time of the year despite the fact that, you know, like the pond that I have in the background on my, on my background image here, despite the fact that that's pretty big, if they can see another pair on there, they will not tolerate it. So they will have this battle and one of them will get chased off. And so, you know, as things go drier, that's the challenge that we have is the available habitat, um, you know, is, is shrunk. And so even though there may be pairs available, they're not able to, uh, to sort of take advantage and breed because of that territorial behavior. So, you know, that's why our work is important is ensuring that when we have the right environmental conditions that, you know, they're able to take advantage, spread out, you know, not have that territorial interaction and they're all able to, to do their thing. So the more habitat that's available, the more diversity of species that we're able to accommodate and higher numbers. So we definitely see populations increase when we have a good habitat base and we have good environmental conditions. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, before we, we go, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, which could just maybe be my user error. If we were to unmute you all, is it possible that you might have a question that you just want to just ask? Can we, can we maybe do that? We have Sean, our technical support and Zoom lifesaver on, on the line. If we were to unmute everybody, would it just be chaos? <laughs> I think we're I think we're pretty polite people. Oh, look at here's Terry. Do you have a question for us? Um, I, I've gone through the chat, but it's coming back as privately. It's not saying to everyone. So uh, maybe I haven't hit a button right. It's, it's probably well, in Greg Sawchuck here. Hi, Greg. Uh, uh, Greg, Soch Greg Socha, I guess. Um, today, um, I was traveling on our inland highway and uh, a hen mallard crossed with hatchlings. I noticed Scott said that they're in the pre, uh, pre breed stage. Obviously, in West here, we have, uh, we have hatchlings already. I assume it's because of our mild weather. Yeah, yeah, this, that, would be, that would be a very early nester for sure. Um, but yeah, it does, it does happen. Um, in the right climates where things warm up fast, birds, there are definitely advantages to birds getting going early. So that's unusually early, Greg, but not, not completely out of the question, obviously. Yeah, I was sorry, we're on Vancouver Island, so it's quite mild here on the West Coast, but I was quite surprised the traffic come to a complete stop. I couldn't figure out why. I didn't see an ambulance or why the, all the traffic on a four lane road was, was stopped. And here it was a, a hen heading across with her, with her yeah, a covey of about 10. So it's kind of cool. Everybody's enjoying the scene. <laughs> the real uh, my question, question is, did you get my a question? Sorry. No, we, I was too far back and they were, they were in front of other no. people. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, what a missed opportunity. No. Sorry about that, Terry. Go ahead. Uh, my question was, uh, where are the main wintering grounds for most of our Canadian breeding birds? And um, is there st strong protection for those spaces presently? Like a, uh, been a lot of weather disruptions down there, quite severe at times uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. Where is, uh, where is most of our uh, birds that we're seeing up here, where are they presently parking themselves over the winter? Yeah, good question. Um, once again, really depends on the species. So, 
you know, I would say for, for many of the birds that, that breed in the prairie auto region, uh, primary wintering areas uh, for mallards and pintails would be areas like um, lower Mississippi Valley and the Gulf Coast along Louisiana and Texas and in those areas. Um, you know, we, because of the work that DU Inc. has done to, to ensure that we have habitat in some of those areas, most of those are in pretty good shape. And um, that's, that's one of the things that we looked at when we did the recent review of the International Conservation Plan. And the conclusion in the big picture was in most of the wintering areas, there are a few exceptions, but in most of the winter, wintering areas, um, the habitat base is in pretty good shape and not believed to be limiting populations currently. Um, but we need to keep our eye on those because there are challenges in some of those. Some of the birds in the Pacific Flyway would winter in the Central Valley of California and there are issues with water there. Um, in the mid-continent, the Gulf Coast, there are challenges with marsh loss and subsidence and, and those kind of issues there. So there are definitely issues that we have to keep our eye on. But Right now, um, all the information tells us that really the limitations to populations are challenges on our breeding areas. Well, I do know that Arizona, when I used to go down there, um, that the, the uh, waterfall found golf course water um, quite quickly and, uh, and uh, took it on as, its win as their winter territory by the thousands. They, they, they uh, stopped yeah, there, including especially. herons, and, uh, and, uh, and so lucky for that, the, that was the side benefit of golf courses in the, in the desert, was it gave uh, waterfowl uh, a winter home. Yeah, yeah especially in, in dry areas like that, they will take advantage of you know, almost any water that's there. So not surprising that you see them concentrated in those situations for sure. Calvin had a question. What causes a species to select different nesting sites? Yeah, so different species have, have sort of evolved differences in where they prefer to nest. Um, and it, it's a good question. I'm not sure we know why they've, they've sort of arrived at those different preferences, but those preferences are definitely prevalent. Um, you know, we see some species like pintails that really will almost nest in, in any kind of cover. So they nest in stubble and you know, with, without much residual cover at all. And that's in comparison to things like mallards that really like thick cover, you know, thick shrubby areas or tall thick grass is their preference. So we see the whole range. Um, th those two are probably at the extreme, mallards seeking the most dense cover, pintails not really having a preference for dense cover and then most of the other species in between, at least for upland nesting waterfowl, like the dabbling ducks. Um, diving ducks, almost all of those are over water nesters, so they're building platforms in, you know, in the cattails or bulrush and uh, nest over the water. Um, but, you know, at, at some point they, they, were, they were sort of selecting nest sites because it gave them advantages. And the ones that, that were more successful had more of their uh, you know, offspring in the, in the next generation. And that's how those sort of preferences evolve. Uh, we oh. have a question from our leader that says, what is the strangest place you've ever found a nest? Okay. Um, so at least for me, I, I, a number of years ago, I, I probably don't want to calculate how many, uh, I'd worked on the uh, Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Assessment Project, biggest research project that was probably ever done on breeding waterfowl. And I was stationed in Saskatchewan at the time, and so we were following around radio mark mallards. And, uh, you know, I was tracking this hand and couldn't figure out where she was and where she was trying to nest. And I was sort of in an old abandoned farmyard and had the antenna and was figuring out, you know, she's right around here somewhere, but I couldn't figure it out. And then she flushed out of a crow nest about 30 feet up in a tree above me. And it's like, oh, that's where she was. But, um, you know, I was not looking, you know, up, up in the trees for where she might be nesting. But that's where the, that mallard chose to nest and probably a pretty safe location. So um, mallards are, are probably most well known for nesting in odd areas. And uh, they're, they're sort of very adaptable and, and 
find unique nest locations for sure. Calvin has a follow-up question, which is what nesting habitats are at greatest risk and why? Yeah, well, I would say that if I think about the prairies, which is probably what I know the most about, um, you know, the upland nesting dabbling ducks nest in grassland. And so, you know, historically native grassland was the primary nesting habitat. And that's probably the, the most threatened and we, we have the least amount of that habitat left is the native grassland that's never been plowed. Um, the unique thing about those habitats is uh, waterfowl obviously nest there, but because of the diversity of that grassland community and all the native plants, there are a whole host of other species that nest there too. There would be a whole suite of grassland nesting songbirds, there would be shorebirds, there would be raptors. So, you know, those, those kind of native habitats are really the most diverse nesting habitats that we, that we find. And um, those are the ones that have, have, we've seen the greatest losses. And so I would say those are the ones at, at greatest risk. And, you know, a, a lot of the work that we do and that I'll talk about here in a second, um, you know, is focused on protecting those where we still have those intact. So that's, that's definitely a focus of, of the conservation work that we do. Um, what is a, like a typical territory within the duck world? Like how big? So a, a, a pair lands in a pairing pond and like how much real estate do they need? Yeah, so it, let's, let's pick, a, we'll, we'll pick a blue wing teal this time. And we'll say, you know, they're, they've set up their territory on a pond. It, it could be a couple ponds that they would use. And um, sort of their territory size or home range would be relatively small. So, you know, if there was another pond kind of over the hill that was visually isolated, we could probably have another pair there. And then for blue wings, um, you know, they nest in the uplands, but not very far from the water. So, you know, it would be common for the female blue wing to nest, you know, within two or 300 yards of, of the nearest wetland. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the case for teal. In contrast, mallards and pintails could, could nest up to a mile from the nearest wetland. Um, and they would have multiple wetlands within their territory that, that the female would use and feed in and, uh, and take advantage of to gather those food resources. So there is sort of a contrast depending on the species again, but smaller home ranges for species like teal, larger for things like mallards and pintails. And last question before we move to the next section is in Eastern Canada, okay. should we be concerned about the increase in interbreeding between mallards and black ducks? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. That's been uh, a subject of, of research and work for a while. Um, and, and I know that, you know, the information that we have in hand says, yes, there, there are definitely sort of hybridization issues with mallards impacting black ducks. That seems to be more prevalent and more of an issue in the southern part of the breeding range in the US. And we see black duck populations across Eastern Canada having less of those issues and being in better shape um, than, than the, the portion of the population that breeds a little further south in the US. So it is definitely an issue um, that people are concerned about. It's not clear how you address it. Um, you know, we, we still focus on maintaining the good habitat base because we know black ducks have to have that, but those habitats are also probably just as suitable for mallards. So it's one of those things that we think those two species were closely related and probably became species by being separated. Now they're, they're back together in, in breeding in the same locations in, in some localities and that's why we have the hybridization challenge. Is there any research, like research that's underway to, to understand this issue, issue more? There has been some work done recently with the genetics of Eastern mallards. Um, and and it's, it's interesting. Um, I know I just, I just saw some traffic on that this past week. And, uh, and it suggests that many of the, the mallards in the Eastern US and probably trickle into Eastern Canada are not of the same genetics as the mid-continent. 
they're more similar to game farm mallards that came from European descent. So we know that there were lots of releases of game farm mallards in the eastern U.S. Um, and it looks like that genetic component has definitely sort of spread throughout the existing population we have now, which probably isn't ideal. Those are more, you know, feral game farm stocks that probably don't fare as well um, in the wild. And, and there are actually challenges. We see declines in those eastern mallard populations. So it's, the genetics of it is interesting. Well, thanks, Scott. That was great. And thank you for all of your questions. Please keep them coming. Scott, with that, we're going to let you move into section two, which is, okay, my favorite part, I'm not going to lie, uh, where we actually talk about this return on investment. So go ahead, Scott, we'll let you take it away. Okay. All right. So, you know, we just talked about some of the cool courtship stuff that goes on. Really, it's having that healthy habitat base that provides the stage for all that drama to unfold on. So we're going to try and zoom in and, and talk about that habitat base a little more here. Um, and I'm going to focus on the prairie region just because that's the area that I probably have the, the best knowledge of and familiarity. So if we think about that prairie region and birds coming back to breed there in the springtime, um, there are two key components of that habitat base. So in the blue circle here, you see a small, shallow wetland. Those are really important. Um, they warm up quickly in the springtime. Those shallow ponds are the ones that are full of invertebrates that the females need to, to sort of feed on and, and gather the protein that will become the eggs and the, and the little ducklings. So, you know, there's a focus on small wetlands, and then for upland nesting dabbling ducks, they nest in that upland, upland cover in the grass. So, you know, I circled in red here some of that grassland cover in proximity to the wetlands. So those are the key habitats that we're focused on with our programs. Um, one of the primary tools that we use right now is purchased conservation easements. And if you haven't heard about those before, uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada works with landowners and they come forward and we purchase the right to cultivate the upland areas, the right to drain or fill the, the wetlands, and the right to develop, you know, put a building or a house um, on either the wetlands or the grasslands. Um, the landowner maintains ownership and all of the other rights that come with that property and the agreement that we sign is perpetual and is actually attached to the title of the land. So if that landowner turns around and sells the property, that conservation easement remains attached and continues with that property in perpetuity. Um, so as we figure out where to apply these tools, we have a whole host of science planning tools that help us do that. Um, what I've shown here is, is uh, a tool that we call the, the decision support tool that really the information that you see displayed here is the density of wetlands that translates into the density of pairs of ducks. So um, the darker outlines are, are sort of boundaries that we put on some of those areas and we call those target landscapes. So we know that if we're able to use tools like this, we're able to focus in areas where we have high densities of birds coming to breed, we have high densities of wetlands, and our investment has more impact on more birds for the same unit area. So we have a whole host of other planning tools and maybe in future sessions we will have some of the staff from the Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research come on and share details about those. But that's just one of the tools that we use to help focus our efforts and make sure we're efficient with the dollars that we invest. So what's the scale of the impact of the work that we do out there? So the map that I show here, um, in the crosshatched are those same target landscapes that we saw identified in the previous map. But now we have a bunch of little green dots and little blue dots scattered across those areas. Those are the conservation easements and revolving land purchases that we did this past fiscal year, our fiscal year 2020 that ended in March. So just in that year, we did nearly 17,000 acres of conservation easements associated with either directly purchased conservation easements or conservation easements that come through our revolving land program, where we purchase the land and do restorations and then we attach the easement and sell it back into private ownership. So 
big impacts across across all three of the Prairie Provinces. Um, we see continuing demand from landowners for these easements and protecting the habitat base that they have. And there are obviously economic impacts for them that they benefit from, from the payments. So now we're gonna zoom in to, to just one of these areas. So the area that I've circled is the uh, Minidosa Shoal Lake landscape in Manitoba. And we're gonna kind of zoom in and take a look at what a particular project looks like on the ground. So you get the feel that we're doing these all across the prairies, but we're gonna zoom in and take uh, a look at what does an individual project look like. Um, so as we zoom in a little bit uh, in the little, in the little uh, star area here, that's the location within that Shoal Lake target landscape that we have. So you can see it's kind of just north of Brandon and a couple hours west of Winnipeg. And then as we zoom in a little further, this project was actually three quarter sections. So this is the Pearson conservation easement. And I'm gonna zoom in to the, the quarter section that's in that bottom right portion of the map that you see here. And this is kind of what, what that individual tract of land looks like. So maybe the first thing that should strike you is, wow, look at all the wetlands. There are over 50 wetlands on just this quarter section. Um, so really high density of wetlands. You know, I would say our, our science planning tools did a good job of getting us in the right place here. So this easement has forever protected all of those wetlands. And then the remaining area that you see there is grassland. So it provides all of that nesting habitat. Um, so this project in particular, uh, in total on those three quarter sections, we protected forever 246 acres. The total cost of that project was $176,000. So that works out to $715 per acre. Uh, the funding for that project, you know, we talked about the importance of funds that we get from donors like all of you in the beginning. Here's how that breaks down. So on this particular project, $44,000 came from donor funds. Another $44,000 came from the Canadian federal government um, and they require matching funds um, when they invest money. And then another $88,000 came from the US federal government through North Americans Wetlands Conservation Act funding or NACA you'll hear us talk about. But once again, the beauty of projects like this and those funding sources that we have to take advantage of is when we get donors to bring money to the table, you know, for the $44,000 that this donor invested, we got $176,000 worth of conservation work done. So that's pretty impressive. We're really able to leverage those dollars and maximize the impact. So what are the benefits of that work? You know, you look at that property, there are all those wetlands. Well, there, there are lots of benefits. Obviously there are benefits to a whole suite of, of waterfowl. That's what we focused the work to get was those waterfowl benefits. But there's also a whole bunch of other benefits. And I'll admit in the past, um, you know, in, until probably the last five or 10 years, we hadn't talked much about these other benefits. But there's a whole suite of really cool shorebirds that take advantage of this habitat. We've got a marbled godwit here. Uh, things like these other shorebirds um, nest in these areas. These are really cool little guys uh, that, that also nest in these areas. We have grassland birds that, you know, we talked about that earlier. They're taking advantage of that grassland habitat in addition to the wetland habitat to nest in these areas. And, um, you know, in some of the reports that come, have come out recently, we see that grassland birds were the group that saw some of the biggest declines. So benefits to these species are really important. And then finally, we have a map here. There's also a bunch of species at risk that, that have been in trouble or their populations have been declining. And um, the map that we show here shows how many species of risk um, are found in those different target landscapes. So if you look at that Shoal Lake landscape where that project that we just looked at is contained, there are 29 species of species at risk that would be found in that area. So this is the short-eared owl here. Um, so they can be found nesting in those areas. And so, you know, there are benefits to a whole suite of species that are important to think about. But it goes well beyond the biodiversity benefits too. Um, you know, we calculated some of the benefits uh, of ecological services is, is sort of the big bucket that we put these in. And so when we think of 
the amount of runoff that comes from the snow melt or from rain. Um, just that project that we looked at stores 116,000 square meter, cubic meters of water each year, removes 454 kilograms of phosphorus from that water each year, so filters out some of those nutrients. Same thing for nitrogen, 4,500 kilograms of nitrogen per year are filtered by the wetlands and grasslands there. And then the carbon storage in those wetlands is just shy of 15,000 tons of CO2. So one of the things that I like to talk about is, you know, forever we've talked about the waterfowl benefits and we've started to talk about those biodiversity benefits. But the reality is that all of our projects have had all of those benefits since we started, you know, over 80 years ago. So now I tell people that the waterfowl project is the shorebird project, is the grassland bird project, is the water storage project, and is the nutrient project. So that's always been the case. We're just doing a better job of telling that story and, and making everybody aware. So I think it's an exciting time. Um, as we look at the landscape out there, we, we do have lots of opportunity. There are lots of landowners interested in the conservation work that we're looking to do across the landscape. We have very healthy funds coming from Canadian federal governments, from US federal governments. So it's a time where it's even more important. Um, the dollars that folks like all of you as donors provide are even more valuable to sort of leverage and provide those matching funds that we can take advantage of. But we really have great opportunity now. And I think the sky's the limit um, as, as to the impact that we can have across these landscapes. So we appreciate everybody sort of joining in um, remotely tonight instead of in person like we'd like to do it. Um, but I think at this point, maybe we have opportunity to take some more questions. So I will stop sharing my screen and we will see what we have. Scott, that was great. Your career in PR is just beginning. I liked all of that. I, uh, I want to I, I sort of talk a little bit more about the numbers before we open it up to questions. You know, we talked about those sure. ecological services, but I mean, we can put real numbers behind that. Um, for those of you that had the chance to peruse last year's annual report, the ecosystem services um, delivered on our, on our work has a total economic value to Canadians of 4.9 billion. Now that to me sounds like a pretty fancy return on investment. Additionally to that, you talked about species at risk and um, Canada's State of the Bird report that came out last year, which we were part of and was led by ECCC, uh, really talked about the state of our songbirds and our grassland birds and it had anticipated that Canada since 1970 had lost between 40 and 60% of those cute little fat birds that we all love so much that you know, we, we like ducks want to see them fill the sky. And so I think that really this one project, while you know, not in Alberta, and I forgive you for that, really helps to show the full, the full range of the impact that, that we want to have. And, and we want every single person who is proud to say we're part of our conservation movement can say, I'm part of this impact. So that's great. Calvin asks a great question here. Uh, with variations in weather and land use changes over the range of migration, what would be the target for habitat protection, either in a percentage or total area? And has it been met? And maybe yeah. you can just speak well, to your region. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll zoom into the prairie. So we have a group that we're a part of that includes uh, you know, the Environment Canada and climate change folks and, and provincial folks called Prairie Habitat Joint Venture that, that we play a big part in, but all of those other partners are at the table. And so every five years we go through a planning exercise looking at that, you know, what's the, what's the big picture? How much habitat do we need? What kind of progress have we made with the programs that we've delivered? And, and I can tell you that, you know, there's a focus on keeping the habitat in place that we've got. So there's a bunch of goals that are related to, you know, retention or keeping habitat in place that still exists out there. But there's definitely a restoration component too that, that needs to happen. So, you know, we have detailed goals for all of that. It's, it's still a pretty big scale. We still have a ways to go. You know, there's, there's quite a bit of habitat that exists out there that we need to protect. 
And then, you know, we need to restore some, especially on the wetland side, that would be where we probably need to do more wetland restoration um, than, than grassland restoration because we've seen much more dramatic losses in wetlands. So, you know, there are big targets in each of the prairie provinces for wetland restoration and we're helping with that. Um, but I think what's important is if, uh, you know, we do a bunch of work in other things like wetland policy, where if we can get the right wetland policy in place, that kind of keeps the base um, stable. And then we're able to do wetland restoration and add to that and really incrementally, you know, increase the amount of habitat that's there. So that kind of work is important. And, you know, in a couple of the provinces, we have pretty good wetland policy. In, in Manitoba, we have recent policy that's pretty good and will protect wetlands and will allow us to sort of gain some wetlands as we do restorations. And in Alberta, that's the case too. We still have some some progress to make in Saskatchewan, unfortunately. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Go ahead. This ties. Uh, I read recently that uh, when you go back to federal funding, that it looked like that the federal monies were tied to DU identifying itself more as a conservation group and a little bit less hunting focused, that it was deemed from what I was reading a little bit, a little bit um, special interest. Um, I don't like to really use that. That's the only thing that comes to mind. But was there talks from the federal government that uh, DU to get more money or um, or monies had to redefine its overall position. Did I read that right in the talk of, of, about the hunting side of it? Yeah, good question. Uh, I'm not sure. What what I do know is that um, you know, as as some of the uh, the big pots of money that came from the Canadian federal government rolled out recently. There was a focus on, you know, the amount of habitat that could be protected, and, you know, we were we were pretty successful in that process, and I think that's a result of our track record of, you know, we can show, you know, the results that we can deliver and and have delivered in partnering with them over the recent time. So so I would say, you know, for us, when we're at those tables and talking with with the government folks, we're able to just point to our track record and say, you know. We're a conservation group. We have support from all kinds of people that, that hunt and have other interests, but that's what we deliver on the ground. The product that we are able to deliver with the money you give us is conservation that delivers all these biodiversity benefits and delivers a whole host of these other benefits, including you know, things that help us mitigate climate change and help us deal with you know, runoff and nutrient issues and all those kind of things. So I think we've seen success and and I, at least I, I haven't been on, on any discussions where the federal government has asked us to sort of redefine who we are. Um, you know, for 80 years, we've been delivering this great product out on the landscape, and I think it's more relevant uh, today than it's ever been. So they seem to recognize that too. And as a result, we've been very successful in, in getting funding, both from the Canadian federal government and the U.S. federal government. Well, it looked like the hunters were, um, the DU members that were hunters, they uh, there is a, a, a fair number of them looked upset about some recent uh positioning from du and um i'm not sure exactly but they voiced their concerns about some du statements i'm i'm not a hunter but i just wondered about the positioning because they were upset about about some changes that they perceived going on again okay yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either, but I, I would say at least on the funding front, we've been very successful and, and I would even go so far as to say we're a preferred partner for both the Canadian and US federal governments, just because we have, we have the track record of getting the work done and we're able to bring lots of those matching dollars to the table. So, you know, the result of getting all that stuff done across the landscape definitely benefits hunters that, that have that interest, benefits bird watchers, mm -hmm. benefits just all the citizenry of, of you know, Canada because of those water quality and water storage and carbon storage benefits that we provide. So, you know, I, I think there's, 
there's something in, in our work for everybody. And, and that's part of the message that we're trying to get out. No matter what you have interest in, we're likely delivering benefits that are important to you. Don't disagree at all. I agree 100%. Terry, when the uh, new International Conservation Plan came out last year, uh, Dave Howarder and I had a conversation about this very same thing around how do we make sure that as we open up the umbrella to make sure that we, from a brand perspective, are, are welcoming to every, everyone, how do we make sure that this important group that's been so much a key part of our, of our legacy and our heritage you know, how do, how do we continue to be a group for everyone without leaving anyone behind? And, and the conclusion that was largely drawn from, from that leadership level is that it is the diversity of our voice that, that is our unique service proposition, that we are a place that welcomes everybody in the spirit of shaping the landscape that is in line with our identity. So it's, it's not lost just on the funding side. It's also something that's being thought about from a brand side. Right. I agree. So I want to ask a question about natural infrastructure, because I know your counterpart, Mark Lutney, who oversees Ontario, Quebec, and the two uh, coastal regions, uh, yep. a big, big piece of his business is natural infrastructure, working with municipalities and communities to ensure that wetlands are part of the design of the landscape use, that people are making investments in natural infrastructure as a key part of how they're building back their communities better. How does that translate into your regions in the prairies? Yeah, so, so we're definitely trying to have those same conversations. There have, been, there have been a few challenges just with the way the federal government has structured some of the, uh, some of the funding um, for, for natural infrastructure. And, and one example would be they have a, a minimum sort of project or proposal that you need to meet, which is $20 million, which that's a big project. Um, and, you know, that's been one of the recommendations that we said uh, in conversations with the federal government folks is, you know, if that were reduced, we could develop proposals with municipalities and with local interests that would, would provide exactly those benefits, you know, just like the water storage benefit we talked about for the project we looked at, those are there on every project that we do. And when we do wetland restoration, we increase those values. And so it provides those benefits. Right now, we haven't had huge success in tapping into that money, but the benefits are definitely there. And it's conversations that we continue to have with our provincial partners and federal partners to try and get the program structured so that we can take advantage of it. That's great. Thanks, Scott. Are there any other questions that you have? One more being a city boy. I wondered with DU, just in a general, um, whether they'd looked at more city type projects to have that beautiful green mallard logo in front of more people. We're visible out in the, in the, uh, in the uh, rural, but I just wonder, living in Edmonton, um, if there has been talk about finding ways in smaller projects in cooperation with municipalities and so on to be, to be, uh, to have a bigger presence in front of a bigger population to get our message out. Yeah, the, there have definitely been some of those discussions that we've had, you know, that there could be value in, in doing exactly what you said, Terry, is identifying some projects that would give us greater exposure, help educate people about the work that we do. Um, we are able to take advantage of in, in some more urban settings. We do have a presence already, like Winnipeg's a good example where we have our native plant solutions group that does deeper service work, but does things like stormwater retention ponds and, uh, and landscaping and new developments. Um, and so we're, we're trying to figure out how do we leverage that and develop the signage and the communications pieces like you talked about. So there's better awareness of all of these benefits that we've talked about tonight because they're, they're all there in the projects that we do, whether that be in an urban setting or in the, in the rural areas. Thanks. Scott, yep, uh, what would the impact 
what impact would the flooding of the Athabascan, I'm guessing river, I'm, I'm reading a question here. What impact would the flooding of the Athabascan yep. river have on successful nesting? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, seasonal flooding is, is something that's not uncommon. So, you know, in that particular location where, you know, in that, in that case, there were ice dams that caused the river to, to sort of spread out and flood out of its banks. Um, there could be local impacts, especially on early nesting species that had already initiated nests along the river. Um, but usually those are pretty small because those are pretty localized events. And as long as habitat conditions are good, females will re-nest and, and take advantage of, you know, the available habitat there to, to try again. Um, so, you know, those, those kind of events are important locally for sure, but usually the impact is not great at a big scale and, um, you know, if, if, if environmental conditions are good, the birds will re-nest. So that's, that's a, a good uh, adaptation that they've had for a long time. If at first you don't succeed, they'll give it many more shots. They are resilient. Any other questions as we move to wrap up this hour together? Anything else? Anything else on your heart? Let her rip. Oh, question from Justin. Ontario is experiencing record low temperatures in April and May. Will this delay to the nesting or breeding restrict the season? Probably not. Uh, low temperatures, um, it, it, it's interesting. Um, the eggs that are laid by waterfowl until they start incubating, um, they're pretty cold tolerant. So for early nesting species like mallards or black ducks in the east, if they're not incubating the nest yet, those eggs can actually go below freezing and still remain viable. Um, the reality is they're, they're less tolerant on the heat side. So when things get hot, if temperature rises just a little too high, um, that's usually more of a problem and, and the embryos can, can die more from heat than cold. So, you know, just a few days of cold and, and if the female's incubating the nest, then obviously she's keeping them warm and she'll be very diligent during those cold times. So usually cold temperatures are, are not a big issue. And, you know, the, especially the early nesting species have adaptations to sort of deal with that. From your prairie perspective, would you like to close today by giving perhaps the State of the Union on geese? On geese? Yeah, well, I guess I would say that, yeah, at, at least in the mid-continent, geese, geese are in good shape. Um, that's, that's really true with only a few exceptions. Um, you know, and, and I would say that's due to a, a few things, you know, like, uh, these are large bodied and so predation rates are lower, but they've really taken advantage of agricultural foods on their wintering areas to be in better condition, um, to have greater breeding success when they migrate back to, to Arctic breeding areas. Um, so almost all the populations that we could identify of Canada geese, of white fronted geese, snow geese are overabundant. Um, you know, there would only be a couple specific populations that would be that would have lower than, than goal levels. So, so goose populations are very healthy across the board. Great. Well, so I think we're gonna wrap there. I think you've run out of Wi-Fi bandwidth, so that's probably a good time. Um, let me, on behalf of Scott and on behalf of every employee at Ducks Unlimited Canada, who's so proud to work for the organization, committed to such good work. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening. You know, ducks are resilient and so are we, and part of our resilience comes from each and every one of you. So thank you so much for joining us. If you loved this and you want to see more, let us know. Let us reach out to the people who invited you or you can send us a note to info at ducks.ca. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again in person soon when we're all out of the house and we've all had a haircut. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll say bye-bye for now. Take good care, everybody. Bye folks.